cogent advice and inspiration from real self-made millionaires. Welcome to The Eventual Millionaire with your host, Jamie Masters. Welcome to Eventual Millionaire. I'm Jamie Masters, and today on the show, we have Howard Marks. I am so excited. He was founder of Activision, and the amount of games that I used to play when I was younger, I need to bow down to this man. He now has StartEngine.com, plus uh, so many awards that I can't even go through all of them right now. Thank you so much for coming on the show today. Yeah, I'm happy to be here. It's insane what you've done in your past. So can you just uh, very, very briefly go over some of the games and some of the huge successes that you've had in the game industry? Because you're not even in the game industry anymore. So tell me about that snippet really quick. Well, if you think about it, I didn't start my career in the game industry. I was an engineer at the University of Michigan, started my first company. I was playing games all the time uh, for the, the micro computer, the personal computers like Apple II and and different machines like that, and and felt that you know my business partner and I we wanted to be involved in games because we thought there was a future. When everybody at that time saw, saw the Atari debacle and said, you know, it's over, games are done, you know. And I we didn't buy that for a single moment. We thought it's just beginning. It's just you know how it is. Uh, business cycles, things go up, things go down. So we got into the game industry when things were really bad, and Nintendo just came in was their whole new machine and everybody thought that was a joke but it turned out it was just the beginning of something even a more a larger so activision really at this point uh, for those who, who who may or may not know the company it, it's the largest video game company in the world it's a fortune 500 company as close to a 50 billion dollar market cap and i was the co-founder with uh, my roommate in college bobby kodak the two of us and we did not We just jumped in and decided to start a video game publishing business, and we found Activision, which was a bankrupt company. We bought it for 400 grand control, and then uh, restructured the company, and uh, and then brought it back into life. and And it had a big library of co- games that some of your listeners may know or not, called Pitfall and River Raid and Zork and all these amazing old games. But then, as you probably know today, it has uh, some of the greatest multiplayer games like World of Warcraft and Starcraft and Warcraft and and Overwatch and, and Call of Duty and it's just a, a conglomerate of things and it's now probably going to become one of the largest esports companies. So my involvement was pretty early at the at the inception from beginning where we needed money, where we needed a million dollars just to get started, to the point where uh, we were raising hundreds of millions. It's insane. And, and I don't play World of Warcraft because I'm afraid I will get addicted to it. Like that's that's why I don't go down that path anymore. But way back when, how did you know that the industry was going to come back? Because that's a lot to get into an industry right. that people are thinking it's crappy. Well, it was very simple. And I can give that as advice to all of your listeners. The video game industry, when we got involved, was what we call the cartridge business. And a cartridge is a, it's really basically read-only memory chips in a cartridge that you plug in into the, the console. And the most you could probably put in there was 32 megabytes of game. So you can imagine it usually be a team of one or two or three people who would make the game. And there's not much you can put in there. So there's a lot of creativity to, to make a game really last hours and hours with 32 megabytes. Today, that could be just a graphic on your, on your web page, right? However, we said we saw the, the the announcement of the CD-ROM and media, which is basically a disc, and you can record on it hundreds of megabytes, hundreds of megabytes, if not gigabytes, right? And that to us was the strategy. We said, let's jump forward and believe that all the new game consoles are going to get rid of cartridges. Why? Because they're extremely expensive to build, and if you have an inventory that is not sold, you're bankrupt, basically. And that's what happened to a lot of the game companies, including Atari. They had built millions of cartridges. They had to bury them underground in 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 Nevada because they had no place to use them for. They were, and you talk about a lot of hardware, right? Millions and millions of unsold cartridges. The inventory levels were killer. Well, guess what? The CD-ROM cost 50 cents to make, 50 cents, a dollar. Who cares at this point? 
you take something that costs twenty, thirty dollars to to a dollar. And it told us from a strategy point of view, if we pursued it this way, we would build a very large game company. And then we decided to spend real money on the content as opposed to on the media. So the content, we would go and spend a million dollars to make a game, which at that time in the early 90s was an insane number. Today, it's in a hundred millions and plus. But at that time, we were ahead of that time. So we were making games that were people were looking and saying, wow, this look amazing. But you needed a machine. So when Sony launched their their real first, the PlayStation with the CD-ROM, it was a, a, a huge hit and we rode the wave. Okay, so how did you know? How did you look into the future so far ahead and sort of see what was coming and skate where the puck went? Because that's what you're doing, what I see with the new business that you've got for Star Engine anyway. So how did you, how do you have that innate sense of when this happens and I think this will happen, then I think this will happen and then charge through? It's obvious. It's really obvious and I'll tell you why it's obvious you know many times in business a new business emerges with a 10x model what is 10x and you and you you, you have people like Peter Diamantes who is brilliant who always talks about the abundance the 10x factor so what is 10x so look a cartridge was 32 megabytes a CD-ROM was 600 megabytes the cost of a cartridge was $20 the cost of a CD-ROM, let's say, was a dollar. You got the 10X. So now whenever you see in an industry a 10X shift because of technology, you know there's something that's gonna be enormous, right? That was it. That's all you need to think about, that the change of the medium is gonna generate and usher a whole new generation of people who need to be adapted for that CD-ROM and not the cartridge. So all the companies who were still doing cartridges, they were dead, they just didn't know it. See, but how did how did you elect yourself as the one? Not they're gonna switch and they'll change or somebody else that's bigger will come in and do it better or whatever. How did you go, I'm gonna be the one that's gonna do it? Right, so that's how it's gonna, your listeners are gonna learn. It's called Innovator's Dilemma. It's very simple. If you have a business model that you already are very successful with, like the, the cartridge business, you wanna protect it. So your head of marketing is gonna say, hey, Let's, let's release this new cartridge, this new game in three months. And everybody's thinking only in cartridge. They don't have time to decide, hey, let's stop right now. We're going to be dead. We're going to run into a wall because that's not a fun conversation. And let's do everything in CD-ROM. And then they'll say, well, there are no CD-ROMs out there. So they have too much to lose. We had nothing to lose. Mm. Nothing. We came in with a blank piece of paper and say, okay, we're going to do something are we going to go and do the old stuff, which everybody's doing, or are we going to do something new? And we know everybody's going to move towards that because the obvious. And you can see that with what's happening with uh, live streaming and, and, and video online versus the networks. You, you can see that right now. It was obvious, but it was not obvious when the Internet was so slow. It was not obvious, but we knew it was going to get faster. And you can see the same thing with the crypto and blockchain happening now, the exact same thing. Okay, let's talk about that. So first, give a little heads up on what startengine.com is so people can get that understanding. And then we'll talk about blockchain and ICOs and all that fun stuff too. Well, it's very simple. So I had to pick a mission and I recommend your listeners to pick a mission that is inspirational. A mission is not, I'm going to make a widget and sell it into stores or online. The mission we have is to help entrepreneurs achieve their dreams. It's a big mission, right? And how do they achieve their dreams? The strategy is to help them raise capital online from their crowd, the general public, the main street investor, who in the last 80 years has not been able to make those investments because they didn't have uh, access, they were not permitted. You know, the, the idea of investing in a startup has always been for wealthy people. And now with the new Jobs Act that came out in 2012, which is uh, uh, an act that was bipartisan in, through Congress at a time then most things were not bipartisan, signed by Obama April 2012, ushered a whole new opportunity and it's it, it's the 10x model is coming back and you'll see why because think about that 80 years where an, an, an ordinary investor cannot invest and now they can and most brokers that you you'll find they'll want to sell you mutual funds they're going to want to sell you munis and all sorts of strange naming products for your investments but here you're able to take maybe five percent of your money and say you know what i'm going to make my own bets and I'm going to come in early, which is where value creation happens. However, 
coming in early presents a tremendous amount of risk. So I'm only going to take a few of my a few percent of my net worth. People who want to start an engine are able to invest a thousand dollars into a company. This is a revolution because the idea of investment in the past has always been oh five thousand, ten thousand. You know, a broker a broker is not going to talk to you for a hundred dollar investment you put on your credit card. They don't even know what you're talking about. But here, that's what's happening here on Start Engine. People are taking their credit card out, putting a hundred dollars in owning shares in the company. That's where the 10x model is. It could be a, actually a hundred x because typically. Wealthy investors are 5% of our, of our country, about 5%, and 95% are not. So guess what? The 10x model is now we are multiplied by 10, the number of potential investors who can invest in companies like yours, companies that are entrepreneurial focused. And that's where it seems so obvious that most people didn't see. Will ever invest online to buy stock? Okay. That's why I'm going to do it, because the, the belief system was that the ordinary investor is not going online to buy shares. They're going to be going online to consume media. They're going to buy on Amazon. Why would they buy stock? Well, to me, it was such an obvious. I love how you can see this. Okay, so for the person that is the entrepreneur that wants investment, actually, I just had an interview with someone, and we were talking about investing, uh, getting investors or not, and one of the things that most people say is, I don't want somebody breathing over my neck, right, going, you have to sell the company at this, you have to grow faster, right, when we have real investors that have a, a huge stake in the company. So how does it work with with the Start Engine? When, when you get people that are investing, they have a, a piece, correct? And, and uh, explain the model, too, because like going to the site, everybody should check it out anyway, because it's super cool just to look at all the different potential things you can invest in for like 100 bucks here. It's, it's insane. Um, but when that happens and when they do get funded, what does the structure look like, right? Is it um, they just get a piece and, and do you ever know who they are? Do you not know who they are? Do you talk to them? Like what is the, the entrepreneur's viewpoint of their investors? So here, typically the entrepreneur who's lucky enough to get venture capital money, the terms are very harsh. Yes. They really give up control. They, they think they're getting an incredible valuation. They think they still own a lot of shares in the company, but guess what? The way the structure works is the VC in a way, from the minute you sign, controls the company. And that's life. I understand that, but it's also a Damocles sword that is above your head. At any point, they either kill you or they fund you. I don't know which one it is, we'll decide. At the time, it's important. Every company goes through a bump. And when you go through a bump, that's when the VC may come in and restructure the company, which means your equity is gone and, and probably you are gone too. Uh, too harsh to me. Guess what? If you go and get money from the crowd, you set the terms. To the extent that the crowd accept your terms, great. So for example, you could say, I will sell you common shares in my company, the same as I own. And we will make sure that together we grow the company. So this crowd comes in and let's say funds a million dollars, and let's say there's a thousand people, million dollars. Now you have a thousand people army strong who wants your success. And they're not the ones who are gonna fire you because you, you, you have to bring everybody together. And even then that may not be enough to vote you out. So in a way, the number one thing that the entrepreneur gets through the idea of raising money from the crowd in shares is control and terms. And what you're giving up is, well, you have a thousand people who, who want to know what's going on. So you use the internet to, like I'm doing now, communicate with your crowd. And I do live streams every two weeks on Start Engine for our own race. So we just, you know, we're, we're raising money for Start Engine as well on Start Engine. Why? Because, look, it would be easy for me to go to VC and get money. I don't want to do that because that would be disingenuous. I want to show people, look, we're able to do it as well successfully, which we have, and we're gonna continue doing that. I love it. I looked at that too. I was like, oh, that's really, oh, I thought it was a test at first. I thought it was like a showing how it works. I was like, that's real money. That's interesting. That's, but it's a, a, I love the integrity of you actually doing that too, huh? You actually believe in the premise of your whole entire company as it should be. So what, if somebody does wanna go down this, who are the right people um, entrepreneur wise and like how much should they be making if they're looking for funding how much do they look like can you give us a little bit more of if they want to check it out to potentially get funded um, wh who, who should they be like and what should they do well here's the good news the good news is 
in the past, you have to be a white male who graduated from Stanford if you wanted money from a VC. And I'm using that as a metaphor. Yeah. You know, some of them disagree with me, but you yep. know, women get only 4% of the money, if that, and women of color, well, there's maybe a dozen that get funded a year. So you know what? They, that is so harsh, so cruel, so biased that to me, why even bother? I mean, come on. You know, how many people actually graduate from Stanford a year? All right. So given that the model for VC investing is not generally going to be accepted by, you know, most of your entrepreneurs, I'm not going to get it. Let's be realistic. What else are they supposed to do? They go to see their families. They go to see their friends. That's great. But that's not enough. So Start Engine comes in. You can be a piece of white paper that's saying, look, I'm going to build the next Activision and raise money on Start Engine. You could be someone who has a brewery that has a thousand members in their brewery club that wants to raise money to open a store or maybe a storefront or maybe buy some more equipment to expand the brewery. People to, in fact, what we're finding is that the, the entrepreneurs who are the biggest hustlers, the ones who love going out there and pitching what they're doing, they succeed beautifully. The ones who don't succeed, which is about 30% of the companies on Start Engine, are probably more of the view, hey, uh, let me go out there and let's, let's see if they come. And you know what? The crowd doesn't work that way. To get the wisdom of the crowd, you need to energize the crowd. You need to bring them together. You need to get them excited. You need to communicate. You need to go out there, make yourself vulnerable, and explain where you're at. And the crowd reacts. And that's what we're seeing. Give me some tips on that then too. So if somebody does want to go and do this, because there's tons of crowdfunding tips for like Kickstarter and stuff like that, but right. yours seems a little different. So give us some, how, how would someone go about uh, actually getting funded in the, the full percentage? Right. So the way it works is not that much different than Kickstarter, but it's different in the sense that you're not giving away money. As a, as a person, you're actually investing, is what we show them on the screen. There's all the financials of the company fully disclosed. This is so bizarre, so bizarre, right? The idea that a privately held company is exposing their financials to the public. Anybody can see it, so you don't have to invest to see it, anybody. This is a, a new set of transparency that has not existed before, because if you think about it, a lot of times when you invest in something, you may not know who the CEO is, who the background, who checked it, uh, is there any legal problems, structural problems. We bring it all out there on a page. Everything is out there. So the, the, the investor can make an informed decision and then they can talk to their friends and they can actually go on our page and type their comments, whether it's positive or negative, it's fine. As long as they don't use anything that is offensive, it's great. So the debate, starts and continues on the page, even, even past the, the raise. And so what I tell our companies is, look, this is a journey. Once you learn how to raise money online, you can do that forever and you can be VC free forever. It's like wise words and everybody loves this. I mean, it, there's been so many interviews that I've done where we go VC or not, VC or not, right? Angels, maybe are a little bit, you know, they're called angels. They're supposed to be nicer. No, uh, but but it's it's been a problem for a long period of time that this gets me extremely excited that it's a new way of the future. So tell me a little bit more because I know you have a whole piece on ICOs and I know a lot of people don't understand what that is, especially with blockchain and people assuming that it's all Bitcoin crazy, right? Can you tell us a little bit more, just the basics, so people that don't understand that piece uh, have a good solid foundation? Yeah, well, I'll do it in a very quick way. If you think about Bitcoin, it's great because it's a brand now. People understand what it is. It's basically cryptocurrency. You buy it for a lot of money and you hold it, or you may uh, see it go up and then sell it or trade it. There's all sorts of things, but it's secure. It's very secure if you hold your wallet and you have your key, but if you go on an exchange and they get hacked, you may lose your money, which is not what happens in the stock market, by the way. If you lose your stock certificate, you just make an affidavit and you get it back, which is great. It's more secure, right? So if you think about the blockchain, the revolution of blockchain is it creates a publicly visible way to transact. And it's trustless, meaning you don't need to trust people because it's all true what's in the blockchain. You have 
tens of thousands of computers that compute the same thing constantly to prove that a transaction is real. That is really uh, the fundamental benefit. Now, how does it relate to entrepreneurs? Is for entrepreneurs who have a business and they believe they need a currency inside of the business to transact, they can use the blockchain now very inexpensively. Uh, within hours, you can build a currency, which is crazy, and then use it for with our customers. Now, the ICO, initial coin offering space, is going through a transition. It started out with you know, amazing people who are building blockchain technologies. They needed capital. The VCs wouldn't give them money. Surprise. So what they did is they went to the crowd and they raised money, but they didn't use the rules of the Jobs Act to do it. They just came up with their own rules. And that didn't please the Security Exchange Commission, which has a responsibility to protect investors. But here's what's happening now. This whole initial coin offering ICO phase raised over $8 billion in the last 12 months. But it's going through a transition, and we believe it's a healthy one, which Start Engine is part of, to use the Jobs Act, which is perfectly suited for it. And now those new ICOs are going to be raising money by giving informed information to the investor, which is financials, disclosures, disclaimers, transparency, are there any bad actors involved? That's all going to be now available on Start Engine on other platforms as well. How do we know when people are being honest? Like you said, there's the ones that aren't so much. And now when I say ICO, a lot of people are like, ah, oh, you know what I mean? It's got like a bad rap in this crazy flux that has just gone on. So how do we know who to trust and who not to trust now in this whole crazy system? So that's the good news is we live in a country of laws. And if you follow the law, you're, you're in some way, you're, you have some protection. So why do those laws exist? You know, look, there are scammers out there. We understand that. They're also... And to how do you differentiate? It's not that sim difficult. If you use the Jobs Act, and let's say you on Start Engine raise an ICO for a million dollars initially, that's your pre-sale, for example, then what you do is you go on Start Engine and we check your backgrounds of every investor in the company, over 20%, every uh, officer, and the company structure is all checked. Does the company really exist? Uh, any, any, any fraud in the past? Issues, we go online to see if there's any uh, information we need to know. Once everything is checked out and we get the financials of the company, and, and sometimes once they raise up to over 100,000, they need to be reviewed by a certified public accountant, which is very important. All of that builds trust. But look, there could still be scammers. That if we go through the process of using the Jobs Act, a lot of it is gone. Because people who are trying to scam are not going to go through the effort of building all of this legal structure and exposing their financials and who they are in detail, checked, verified. That's where we make a difference. So not all ICOs are bad. Don't have a bad rap for everybody. We just need to make sure we trust and but verify, <laughs> right? And make sure that we're going, uh, if you are going to do this, you do your research and due diligence on whoever you use. Start Engine makes sense because you're here. So it's easy to talk about um, that you do check that. But but And that's the thing that I think, um, unfortunately, when people don't know very much about it, they just hear what everybody talks about. And then they just back away from the idea of it. And I love the 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 new way, I know you call it ICO 2.0, <laughs> then the next the next wave of, of really changing things. So where do you think this is gonna go? I, I love looking into the future, especially with singularity, craziness and technology. So where do you think small businesses are gonna be when we start moving 10, 15 years into the future? Are a lot of them gonna get crushed if they're not paying attention to this stuff? I, you know, I think it's the opposite. Uh, I'm a very big optimist in terms of why all of this technology, whether it's crowdfunding, crowd sale, blockchain, cryptocurrency, is gonna be a major, major impact for small business. And here's why. If you think about the fundamental, country, the what we live in our country, the fundamental and most important thing is the entrepreneur who creates these high paying jobs, these jobs that our country needs. That's what the entrepreneur is doing. They're creating wealth for themselves, and for society. And in order to promote entrepreneurship, they need capital. Capital is the single, it's the oxygen. 
you run out of capital, you may run out of a business. If you have capital, you can grow your business, you can make mistakes, and you can you know, weather a bump, which happens 100% of the time in a business. There's always a bump, but it's okay if you have the capital to survive it. And you're being smart, you have the right mentors, people in place who really have your best in Why is a revolution? Here's why. The blockchain is going to allow us to have the secondary marketplace. And that's why we're doing on our ICO 2.0, this whole pitch. We're doing our summit on April 20th, which will be live streamed, by the way. So if they go on Start Engine, they can see our live stream live of the conference on April 20th. The path to liquidity is the key. So imagine this. NASDAQ, New York Stock Exchange. There's maybe, what, 20,000 companies in Republic out of the 5 million, five million small businesses in America, 20,000 are the lucky few. You want to go public today, go to go, so go see Goldman Sachs and raise 300 million, 400 million at a big valuation, no problem. Everybody else, forget about it. So the public marketplace has gone for the bigger, the elite of the companies. But what is everybody else going to do? We're going to create that for the small business. We're already doing that. We can raise money for the small business, and then we can allow those investors to trade on a platform. And in order to make that cost efficient, because look, you know, being on the NASDAQ can cost $2 million a year for a company to be public, right? The laws, the rules are crazy. We have found a way so they can do it for tens of thousands, if not a few thousand dollars a year. They can be public facing. They're still privately considered. They're not a reporting company per the rules, but they're private, but they are facing, public facing, all of their financials, everything they can trade. Think about that. So we're recreating what you see in the NASDAQ for small business. We're creating the NASDAQ for small business at Start Engine. You're, we're going to have thousands of companies. We're going to be listed on Start Engine, and then hundreds of thousands, if not millions of people who will be transacting, trading the share. It's that creates exciting. liquidity, and yes. guess what? Liquidity feeds back into buying shares initially, which creates growth, which creates entrepreneurship, which creates economy, which creates jobs. It's amazing. But all of that has to happen because blockchain and cryptocurrency reduces the cost. Now, I'll give you another example that will, your audience is going to understand. The ATM, no big deal today, ATM. In the past, you'd go to a teller to get $100 out of your account. That cost the bank $15, $15. Guess what? The ATM is two cents. Think about it. That's a that's a hundred x better, right? With the blockchain and the cryptocurrency, we're doing the same thing. We're going to be able to do a ten x, hundred x, hundred x. It costs two million dollars to have a public company today. On the average, it's going to be under twenty thousand dollars a year. I love this stuff. Yes, I love. Isn't it? Yes, it's amazing. It's yeah. That's the future. That's happening. Okay. So how do entrepreneurs that don't, that maybe even don't need capital at the second, right? Everybody needs capital, but you know what I mean, uh, aren't, aren't willing to go down this path. How can they start learning more about blockchain or crypto or just start getting their feet wet? Because it does seem a little like jumping all in when we, when you do go for funding in this, in this uh, route, how can they warm up to it? Well, there's a lot of information out there. If you type in Bitcoin on the- But I feel like there's so much crappy stuff too. There's so much. Everybody's and their brother's talking about it. Uh Entrepreneurs can go to resources like my blog, howardmarks.com. I write a lot about all of this. Great. And I have about 50,000 readers a month who come in reading it. Now, it's it's really for entrepreneurs. This is not for the general investor consumer. I mean, they can read it if they want. But for the entrepreneur- uh, so my blog is good, and then you have other people's blogs who are very good. Uh, for example, Ty Lopez, he's a big influencer. He he does talk about this and blockchain and, and cryptocurrency. Nathan Latka, he's another well-known. Nathan's my really good friend. He lives here in Austin. Yes. Right, exactly. And Nathan yeah. is going to be uh, also at our summit. He's going to be moderating and interviewing people. Right. He's great because he can make he can make it very easy for people to understand the business side of things. Mm-hmm. And all of these, these these influencers who a lot of your audience is going to listen to are going to talk about the cryptocurrency and the blockchain because it really integrates into business. Now, in terms of other resources, there's a, there's a blog called Coindesk.com that has information about ICOs, 
information about crypto investors. Um, you know, nowadays, if you go on YouTube, everybody's an expert. Everybody's yes, an expert exactly. on trading Bitcoin. I would be, I would suggest this is a little bit overreach. Um, unfortunately, there are no experts. Uh, there aren't. What is most important is to to make sure that the people who your audience is safe when they invest in cryptocurrencies. They they, they are aware whether they can they have control of their wallet or not. But they can start in for very little money, a few hundred bucks, and get comfortable with it and start learning more. It is an extraordinary uh, opportunity for anybody today to start seeing what the future is going to look like. Thank you. And that was the that was the point. The trust factor is getting a little gray area online. So thank you for giving those trusted resources. So I highly recommend anyone that's listening right now, even if you aren't, don't feel like you know or care about it right now, please do a little due diligence, take a little bit of time and learn about it because it's going to be here whether you read about it or not. So, so just a warning, it's the way of the future. I know we have to start wrapping up. So I'm going to ask the final question, but I love all of this. What's one action listeners can take this week to help move them forward towards their goal of a million? Well, I, I would say this. Most importantly is you need capital. And if you can find capital, great. And congratulations for the very lucky ones. And if you can't find capital, go on, go and find a platform like ours and go out there and, and reach your crowd, reach your audience. It's so much better because now you have proof of concept. If you have a million dollars raised for your company through your audience, the people who care most about what you do, they are going to be marketing you. So it's a new way of a new form of marketing. So I think the, the real big idea for getting to that million dollar net worth is to raise capital at the right terms from the right people quickly so that you can pursue your business and grow it. So we're not looking this way and our business dies because we're looking too much for capital and we don't have enough time to focus on the business. We only have so much time to focus on something. Right. So I uh, really, really agree with you that if we just need an influx, it's 30 days usually for your, for your type of um, funding too, right? Or how many days can it be? Right. The, the minimum is 21 days and, and it can be up to two or three months. But keep in mind, you, you just said it where you spend all your time raising money. But here you're doing both at the same time. You're building your audience of customers and you're raising money. So what's wrong with that? I love it. Thank you so much for coming on the show today. Everyone check that out. I really, really appreciate it. Make sure you go to howardmarks.com. That was the blog that we were mentioning. Yeah. Okay. So that way you can learn a little bit more about it before you go ahead and jump in. Thank you so much for taking the time today. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you so much for listening. I hope you enjoyed that interview. And if you want to check out more amazing resources, I'm only curating the best of the best. Go check out eventualmillionaire.com. You can take the Eventual Millionaire quiz, figure out where you are in business and what you need right now. Plus, you can look at curated resources specifically for you on the new Start Here page. I'm so excited. Please join us. Please let me know if you need anything at all. I'm here for you. And have a fantastic day. Bye.